and welcome to The Caring View, the online health and social care platform educating, elevating and celebrating all things social care. Before we get started, you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell, you will never miss out on an episode, become one of our 1500 subscribers now on YouTube, which I find absolutely incredible. Go and find us on LinkedIn, you can follow us on there and watch us live through LinkedIn or from our website www.thecaringview.co.uk. You can also find all of our free resources, yes, free resources on our website. Everything we do is absolutely free for everyone in social care. And you can also listen to our podcast directly from there as well. Current series is all around entrepreneurs and startups, um, so please do feel free to go and check that out. Our previous series also includes our PIR and how to complete it series. Mark, tonight Tonight, we are joined by yourself, fabulous. Hello, how are you? And we're also joined um, by Tracy and Karen. So I want to say good evening and hello to everybody. Hi. Good evening. Hello. So tonight's conversation is all around CQC, the updates, things we need to be knowing about, what's going on, what's coming up, what's not coming up in some circumstances. So as always, need to preface this with this is our opinions and not of the uh, companies and organizations we represent, just in case. I, you know, mess up and say something about CQC so that I probably shouldn't. And just so everyone is aware, and this is the only thing I will say on this, is we have once again invited CQC to join us on the show and come and talk about this. And once again, they have declined. Um, so we've gone for probably not actually the next best thing. The actual best thing is two wonderful experts in in the world of quality and assurance in care. Um, so Tracy, I want to come to yourself first. Do you want to just give us a quick introduction to who you are? Yeah, I'm Tracy, a director at Virtual Administration. We work predominantly with brain injury case managers and independent therapists. Um, and we help um, uh, companies within adult social care to become registered uh, and submitted with their CQC applications. Thank you so much, Tracy. And Karen? Uh, hi, yes, my name's Karen Ritson. Um, I'm the Director of Outstanding Care Consultancy. I support um, adult social care uh, regulated services uh, with um, with their compliance with CQC, basically do a whole range of things with, with registered services. Thank you so much, Karen. And over to you, Mark. No, that's all right. Lovely to see you both again. I know that you've joined us on podcasts and Tracy, you've joined us live before. So I guess let's dive straight in. So why are the CQC changing the way that they inspect and what are they changing? I don't know who wants to answer first. I'll dive to Karen. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. then. Um, well, the they are they've been talking about changing for quite some time um, in terms of uh, a couple of years back, they started talking about think local act personal and about wanting to make their inspections um, have a more person centered focus uh, and to be able to uh, respond to feedback that they were getting um, and uh, uh, and to um, make their the way that they were inspecting uh, more equality based and, and broader based and uh, more focused on the individual. So uh, they went away and did a lot of research and did some co-production and they came up with the idea of a single assessment framework um, that they uh, will use to regulate and to assess and rate um, all regulated services right across the board. So that's the kind of that's the kind of beginning, the very broad brushstrokes kind of um, answer to your question, Mark. Of course, we can drill down into a, into a lot more detail in terms of what happens in health and social care, um, and you know my particular area, which is more you know adult social care, um, and you know what the proposed changes are going to be, what the timeline might be, that kind of thing. And Tracy, any further insights that you've got? Yeah, I'm just going to be very interested to see how we go from the, you know, the current um, hundreds and hundreds of questions on the key lines of inquiry and how that's going to transfer over to the um, the new quality statements. I think there's 34 of them. Um, I'm already getting lots of questions from uh, from from people saying, you know, uh, you know, how are we going to integrate our current evidence that we've collected during, you know, through all the questions on the Chloe's into the new, you know, is it is there going to be over and over overlap, you know, new questions. So. I think that's going to be quite interesting. And in terms of the Chloe's, is there anything the providers should be doing right now 
in preparation. So I've heard a lot about actually having a Chloe file or having safe, safe, effective, caring, well-led, having an individual file. Any advice or any tips that you can share for managers, care providers that they can do here and now whilst we wait for any further changes? Shall I go, Tracy? Yeah, please. Um, yeah. I think that uh, the, the the key lines of inquiry, of course, there are, are a, a lot of them because they're you know they're meant as prompts. The new quality statements are going to be um, more focused. They're going to be less of of them, as you pointed out, Tracy. But they are also at quite a high level because obviously they're going to be relevant across every regulated service. And so um, I don't think necessarily that will mean that the detail of what the inspectors are going to be looking at and um, gathering evidence uh, for is necessarily going to be less detailed. Mm. Uh, it's just that the headline statements are going to be um, kind of focused down a little bit. So um, I think that um, the five key questions are going to stay. So we're still obviously going to be safe, effective, caring, responsive and well-led that we'll be looking at. Um, and the Chloe's actually transfer across uh, to the quality statements actually quite closely when I've looked at them in some detail. There are some differences which we might want to go into um, and some some changes of emphasis, I think, more than, more than differences, really. Um, and I think thinking about the differences between the Chloe's and the new quality statements might be the way that providers can go in order to help to equip themselves for demonstrating their evidence better uh, when they're preparing for the new style of inspection because it's not just the uh, Chloe's being um, replaced with uh, quality statements that's important but it's the whole way that CQC are going to be inspecting which is, is going to be different and which relies on providers being a lot more proactive about what they're doing about how they're gathering their evidence and how they're going to demonstrate that going forward um, so there's, there's quite a lot actually to, to prepare for and to think about under that. Totally agree. Absolutely agree. I, I, I think it's, you know, whether it's a case of, you know, looking at what you've currently got as in your evidence and then looking at these new quality statements. And as you say, seeing, you know, what can be matched over. But as you said in those the quality statements, even though there's not as many questions, there are a lot more. There's a lot more kind of evidence to, you know, kind of in-depth evidence uh, to go with those those questions. So it's it, it it's really giving it a lot of thought and being practically organised in how you're going to do it. Definitely. Mm. Do you think Mark um, helpful? I don't know what your next question might actually be. This, but do you think it might be helpful for just to outline briefly, as as briefly as I can? what I think the main differences are between the mm -hmm. key line inquiry and, and what the quality statements are. Um, because I think it might actually reassure people that the differences are not fantastically great, but also give people a bit of a steer about, well, actually, this is where we can go with our efforts, mm -hmm. um, you know, in preparing. Do you think that might, might be a helpful way forward? I think that's going to be completely helpful because I think the way, and this is always the case, isn't it, with the Care Quality Commission, um, all views are our own and not the companies we represent, um, it's always the way that actually things aren't put across the most straightforward way. So we're going to have quality statements, but they're not going to be called quality statements, they're going to be called we statements, but we're going to refer to them as quality statements in all of our documentation and the stuff we do, but they're not quality statements, they're we statements. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, a little bit of clarity around, mm -hmm. because you know we sit here and we go, well, actually, if they're going to keep the safe, the caring, the well-led, the responsive, um, the effective, how will that look? Because it's, if it's not going to have um, you know, W1, W1.2, W1.3, oh. what have you like that, yeah. what will it be? And will there be that sort of crossover that there currently is with the Chloe's? Um, and what are these we statements? So, yeah, fire away, Karen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because, yes, it started off with Think Local App Personal, wasn't it, which was a kind of partnership approach. And then there was a, some co-production around what people actually wanted in terms of um, representing their lived experience of, of, of care services. So I think that uh, that's where it all started really and that developed into the we statements, uh, what I want and then the we statement was the provider's commitment to deliver on the, on, on the I part of that. So 
I meaning I would like my care to be delivered in this particular way. We being the provider saying we will commit to deliver your care in that particular way. And then that developed into the quality statement. So, um, so the we statements, as you said, Adam, quite rightly, my understanding is that that developed into the quality statements. And then when you look at the quality statements, under SAFE, what I think that the main differences are, or the main um, slight changes of emphasis are a real kind of emphasis on a learning culture uh, and on um, you know demonstrating that you've got a positive culture around safety with a really big lesson lessons learned kind of focus which to be quite honest was there in the key lines of inquiry it was there in the Chloe's but it was more around if you really demonstrated all of that very well then you were more, your evidence was more moving towards what CQC would be considering and rating as outstanding. Whereas this is much, much more around what we consider now to be mainstream good in terms of rating. So it's around safety through learning and, and learning lessons and being able to demonstrate what you're doing there. And, and having safe systems and doing things like optimizing medicines. So, you know, around, medicine management it's not just the kind of bottom line which is making sure that you're doing that safely it's around how you're making sure that people um are involved in the medicines that they're not on too much medication that it's regularly reviewed so it's kind of move i feel is moving it forward into the realms of you know what might have been high-end good perhaps moving into outstanding i'll keep it brief so if we're moving to effective i think the the change in emphasis there is really strongly on uh, working in partnership and working together with healthcare professionals in order to improve care and outcomes for people. Um, and it's about promoting people to have healthier lives. So there's a lot of emphasis on proactive work with people. Under caring, um, I think the emphasis is much more upon a holistic look, not only towards the people that you're supporting, but also your staff. So, um, you know, if you've got a kind and caring culture towards your staff and that you're promoting staff well-being, um, I think that's a focus as, uh, within the quality statements and it comes across quite strongly. Under responsive, the thing that comes out to me quite clearly is about equality of access for people, uh, being uh, really mindful about the protected characteristics and listening to people's voices uh, who might be quite difficult to be heard. Um, and um, having a really flexible, flexible approach to choice and care and control for people around their care choices. And then under well-led, I think that that, that that emphasis on seldom heard voices is really strong, um, as well as uh, that equality and human rights kind of approach. A really strong emphasis on on governance and people uh, services learning through their experience and through their analysis of data um, and having a, a kind of innovative approach to embracing all things tech perhaps or different ways of being able to look at data and learn lessons which then translates into really good outcomes for people so i think under well-led the emphasis on inno innovation uh, and uh, that that kind of the higher kind of uh, level of um, uh, leadership that I think CQC will be focusing on starts to help us see that I think that the new quality statements are CQC's way of delivering their strategy. So the you know their strategy with the, which they've talked about for a really long time, which we're well into, um, uh, was a, a set of statements. But now I think this is the way that that CQC are going to realize that or they're going to attempt to realize that vision um when they eventually manage to start it <laughs> obviously that's not just yet no and that was honestly really really helpful and really really useful and i'm just going to quickly yeah. come to the comments before we move on and um, tina who's joined us in the comments um and tina said that they're working with uh, we we statement we are working with care providers mapping out sorry i had to say that uh, care providers mapping evidence to regulations which are not changing and then adding them to the quality statements um to them as the regs are, are not changing and that they've run some workshops in this area and that appears to be helping providers which i think's 
a really, really sort of great tactic and a great approach. Um, and then she just followed it up with the information you were giving us then, um, Karen, and said, interesting, and don't you think this reflects um, the Francis recommendations? Um. Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think that's absolutely great. It's a really good point that the, the regulations, by and large, aren't changing. Um, uh, practically, you could say the regulations stay the same. So, if there are any concerns about the changes, the uh, the regulatory framework is is very solid, and so the fundamental standards are still there. You know, um, when people uh, services are being registered, which I'm sure. Uh, Tracy, you would be able to speak to you when you're preparing providers, you're preparing them in a similar way, even though you're also preparing them for the quality statements um, for their for the fit person interviews and being registered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Tracy, go on. No, I was going to say on that that front, the, that side of things hasn't changed. You know, I mean, I've I've seen the you know the brought out the, the newer version of the, the the two main application forms, and they've brought out a, what they call an additional form as well now, which is asking about more end um, insurance and geographical areas, all sides of things like that. But predominantly, it, the the actual application forms haven't really changed. Mm. I just wanted to come back in around the quality statements. I'm just going to share it into the comments so everybody's got it. We did a couple of weeks ago um, share a document on our Freebie Fridays, which I don't know whether it's the updated statements or whether it's connected to the, the current, kind of the older ones. Um, but I actually use this within my, my workplace where I work my 9 to 5 job. Um, and actually, we found it really useful to do. We got the team together and actually went through each single one in a meeting. Um, it did take us a while about actually how we could evidence, because obviously now that the inspectors aren't coming in, you've got to obviously submit all your all your data and everything digitally, how we could actually evidence that and not have a face-to-face -face conversation and maybe say to somebody, oh, look, it's here, it's on the wall, actually, how are we capturing that? Um, and it led to quite a number of actions that were we could take away and actually say, actually, we're, there were tangible ones. Actually, we do this really well, but actually it's not, it's not captured on our computer system anywhere. Let's make sure it's uploaded and make sure it's in a pile. Let's make sure that we streamline our folders and files so actually when the CQC come, we can actually say it's here, here, and here, and that everybody knows where it is. But I've just shared that. It's free to download. Um, Tina's just said, yes, you're always helpful, Mark. Did have a look at it. So pleased that somebody else has found it useful. And it's not just me saying so. But yeah, no, please do check that out. Um, I would give yourself a good few hours to really go through it, but involve your managers, involve your team, because actually they're the ones, you know, you might not be in the business today with a CQC phone or, you know, may turn up at the, the front door. So just talking about the application process, one question that popped into my mind, see a lot of questions kind of on the manager groups around, for new managers, around the registered manager interview. Are there going to be any changes to that process that either of you know about? Tracy, I'll come to you first. The only things that I've I've come across because normally when I what I tend to um, um, suggest when when they've submitted their application form and they've gone through the backwards and forwards, you know, a few sets of emails uh, once they've submitted and that it's gone through, is generally I usually say it takes about ten weeks to have the you know get ready for the initial interview, but I am finding um, uh, some of our uh, case managers and some of the domiciliary care companies that I've helped with that. They've been getting um, contact from uh, people at the CQC a bit earlier than the 10 weeks. And they've been asking them um, kind of like doing like shorter interviews. They've not been an absolute full initial interview. Um, so I think they I think they're trying to do to, to bring in a few different ways of changing things early. Uh, I think that's what I've spotted um, up to now. Thank you for that, Tracy. I have just popped into the comments as well, the new forms that you were talking about for um, CQC registered managers if you're not applying mm -hmm. through the portal. So one question I have for this is when I, you know, did it all, I went all the way through the CQC portal. I presume most people go through the CQC portal now themselves. They'll see the, the, the forms just automatically change on there. The next time they go in, the forms will just yes. be different. Are we really just suggesting to everyone, use the portal, you'll never be caught out then, everything will always be up to date, the portal's the best way to go? Or are we, you know, is there a sort of benefit to downloading the forms and submitting them um, in, an, in a non-digital way? Um, it depends what, it, it, it all depends on, on, on which way that the company wants to go. Um, most definitely, the yeah, it, it, I would say probably it's best to go down the, you know, the online digital because I would imagine at some point the CQC 
I would imagine will want to go proper digital and, and actually downloading application forms will eventually go. That's how I expect it to go eventually. Um, I suppose the only reason why I personally prefer the application forms rather than online digital is that the, you know, there is a little bit of duplication on the forms compared to the digital, but you can, I, I've got it to a point where you can put the whole information together, do an email template, attach all the documents and it's gone in one go. Whereas with the online, in, 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 in some ways, it's not asking for everything straight away. You'll do your online submission and then they're going to ask for more documents. Whereas the other way, I, we've got it to a point where we fill in the, the main application forms, the, the, the statement of purpose forms, and then attach all the other documents, policies and everything that goes with it, business plan, everything like that, and it's gone. That's the only, but that's my personal, personal thoughts. We've had um, in the comments again, we've had um, some hearing that the the interviews um, under the new framework and the new stuff is going to be around three to four hours long, um, which I know sounds incredibly intimidating, and it probably is. All I would say to people, and this is just my opinion, is we do our jobs because we're amazing at what we do and we love what we do and we know what we do. So don't feel like you're... you're um, they are going to try and make sure that your knowledge is there, but... If I was a CQC um, uh, fit person interviewer, I would be wanting to make sure that actually I'm getting the best out of you and teasing mm -hmm. it out of you, not to try and catch you out and trip you up mm -hmm. because we need registered managers. So go into it knowing they just want to get the best from you. Um, so try and feel confident in that. Um, Karen, have you heard anything more about interviews or um, uh, applications and in, in any yeah. changes that we might be expecting? <laughs> Uh, not so much about the changes, but just just experience of supporting people through that registration process as part, as part of what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I would echo what you've said, Tracy, that the when we went through the online um, application process, uh, I was working alongside, like we were walking together into it. You know, I, I hadn't a lot of experience of um, what had been happening over the last six months or so either. Uh, and so uh, it was two heads, you know, looking at the same sort of thing. And uh, we submitted all the online um, information through the portal and then realised that they were then needing to, you know, ask for all the extra information afterwards. And it was just a little bit disorientating. We thought, well, you know, how can we add all this other information in through mm -hmm. the portal? We couldn't, you know, so we felt well, that's that, it. Yeah. thought we'd done it wrong. You know? oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I felt that as well. So, um, and, and also people coming back, um, reporting back to me that, um, yeah, you know, everything that we, we did to prepare was helpful. However, the interview did go on a lot longer than they expected. So that's, you know, that's been my experience as well from coming back from, pro from providers. And I think just echoing on what Adam said, they're not there to catch you out. I've had a number of registered manager, you know, fit for person interviews, and I've actually found them really supportive. If they ask you something about a standard or something that you don't know, actually, I've had one interview where they got it out of their bag and gave it to me and said, you know, look, you passed, but actually just read up on this and here's some further information. So I think if you don't know, don't try and BS your way through it. Just be honest yeah. and upfront and say, actually, I don't know, but... Let me make a note of that and I'll make sure I do some research and, you know, upskill my knowledge on it. Um, Michelle said in the comments that she's heard that they are testing new managers during the interview on their knowledge of the six of the regulations, just cherry pits. So that probably comes back to, I know one of mine was around the human rights and some of the articles in human rights that they wanted me to know. And that's the one where I was like, if I'm honest, I don't fully know. <laughs> so the changes aren't just affecting social care providers. Sorry, Mark, just on that. And this is just my sort of peer support thing in my head. If they do ask you a question and you genuinely fluff up or you do not know the answer, don't just go, I don't know. Back it up with, but I know where I can find that information. I know where I can go and look for help. I know where I can go and find that information to fill that gap in my knowledge. So from this interview, because I'm telling you now that I don't know what it is, I'm going to go and I know where I'm going to go and I know where I'm going to get that information because they know then in those situations, because you can't know everything in those situations where you don't know something in your head, you know where to go and find it. And that will give them so much sort of reassurance in you and your management capabilities as a registered manager don't just go oh no I'm not saying mark that you did this or i don't know but you know don't just go oh i don't know sorry i don't know however 
I will be able to find a webinar or I have a resource or I have a folder or I have a booklet or I have my CQC inspector that I can talk to. Just showcase you know where you can find that knowledge because it shows that you're willing to learn and grow and adapt. Mark, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Go on, Karen. I thought you were going to come in. I was just going to say something. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the idea, I think, behind the a bit longer, at least part of that, um, I think is that CQC uh, is slightly changing their emphasis, aren't they, in, in the in that the registration process now is seen as part of the inspection process in a way, so that their you know their intention is that registered services now will be registered with a kind of nominal rating of good, so yeah. that they'll have assurance that um, you know that there's a kind of an assessment that's gone on there with a rating attached to it, rather than yes, you're good to go, but we're just going to leave you now. That's uh, true. Inspect you later on. Is that what you felt, Tracy? Too? I think very much. I've, in fact, I think I've read that on the CQC's website that they're wanting to put everybody through brand new, so that when they are registered on the on their portal, that you you're starting off at a good. Yeah, I I, I totally agree on that. Yeah, yeah. Good to know. Didn't know that. Um, Tina said in the comment, mock interviews can be helpful too. And I know there's a number of different kind of mock interview bits. Free, some are free, some are paid for. That are available on the on the net. And I think if you work for you know a medium large size organization, you'll probably have a head of quality or a quality team of some sort. So actually, you can always say that this would be their department. You could call on them for advice, um, or you can, if you've been a registered manager before, you've worked somewhere, you've got experience, you could also draw on that experience to answer that question. You don't have to know the you know the the standards word for word inside out. So we know that some of the changes aren't just social care providers so there are changes coming and cqc will start inspecting local authorities and the icbs tracy i'll come to you first what do you know about this and how could this impact on care providers i will be absolutely totally honest with you i don't know a lot um on on that side of things that you know um looking at um uh local authorities and, and what you've just said there i'll be honest i just tend to concentrate more on the adult social care so i will be honest i'm, I'm going to pass to karen on that one <laughs> i don't know much about Tracy. i know a little bit um yeah because so, so new under regulation um through the um uh the, the health and care act from last year 2022 wasn't it that it gave cqc the power to um, assess and rate local authorities and integrated care systems so uh, the local authorities will be assessed uh, from well, sometime this year, I think that the time frame is still in place. Uh, using a subset of the, those quality assessments we were talking about earlier on, um, it's not a formal process as yet, as I understand. So they'll be gathering information initially, which will feed into the state of care report, you know, that's um, presented to Parliament, and then. Um, uh, so the, the data won't be published about any individual local authority to begin with. And then afterwards, once they move into the next phase, um, they'll be aiming to do a kind of first cohort of local authorities where they'll do a full formal inspection. And then they'll rate them under these four themes, which will be working with people, providing support, um, safety in the system uh, and leadership. So they'll have those four main themes. Um, uh, and it'll be local authorities and integrated um, care systems. But the, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen any very clear information about integrated care systems yet, about how they're going to go live with that. So the emphasis seems to be more on local authorities. Um, unless anybody else knows any other information, that was as up to date as I had. No, no more from me. Tina has shared a link from the CQC website around um, the approach to assessing local authority guidance. And I think for me and Adam, I'll bring you in for your, your opinion. I think it's actually really beneficial. I think that it's going to get councils working together more collaboratively. We might see that people are actually cross working to, you know, do almost mini audits on each other. I think there's going to be a lot more transparency and accountability. And I think for a long time, there's been a lot of care providers that have been played off against one another and actually that's probably going to stop because I think there probably will be a fear from the CQC and adult social care departments that actually care providers are now going to get you know the chance to give their opinion on the local authority um, mm -hmm. and I think we've seen you know social care providers 
you know, since the pandemic mainly, you know, working really collaboratively together. And I hope this actually, you know, unites the local authorities and also the ICB so that actually they team up. It's more of a, a single voice, a unified voice actually across the county as opposed to what we see at the moment, which is, it's very different depending on which local authority you kind of fall under. Adam, what are your thoughts? So I have mixed feelings on this. I think local authorities do need to be regulated. I do think they need to have that sort of CQC regulation. Many a time I've been phoned by a local authority and they've gone, oh, you need to reduce this person's care package because we need to make some savings. And I'm like, mm, if I was to do that as a provider, I would be hauled over the coals. <laughs> so I'm glad that there is potentially going to be some repercussions and some regulatory um, sort of oversight. My, my reservations come from the disparity that I still think social care providers are going to face within the world of regulation. If you regulate a care home and that care home is by CQC standards not fit for purpose, you go through um, you know a variety of in inspections, you end up in special measures, you're still not working, six months later you're shut down and everyone's shipped off elsewhere. Terrible for everyone involved. If you're a hospital, you can't just shut a hospital down. Huh. And a hospital can live in special measures for God knows how long. And, you know, I think the local hospital near me has been in special measures about 15 times. If that was a care home, whoomph, they'd have gone. And I just have this horrid, deep sort of reservation that if local authorities are underperforming and aren't meeting their sort of regulatory requirements and needs and are getting requires improvement or inadequate reports, that the outcomes and the repercussions of said reports will be nowhere near as severe as they are for local providers and for, for social care providers. And actually, social care providers, the care that in, in the majority, yes, there are crap ones out there. There are shit ones out there that really do abuse people and are awful and should never in the light of day be close to anyone that we class as vulnerable. I, I get that. The majority of underperforming providers underperform because actually the underperformance is the tip of the iceberg and below that water is underfunding below that water is poor infrastructures in the local areas poor education from the education system lack of resources from local authority lack of resources from the health sector and actually that poor inspection at that care home is accumulation of a system-wide failure and I feel so sorry for those small providers that have to pull up with those really bad reports because actually they're drowning in a sea of poor infrastructure. So yes, local authorities do need the inspection. They do need the regulation. However, there needs to be a parity in how we then approach those that have got poor regulation. It should be a one for all sort of thing. I get a local authority is vastly different from a small provider, but a small provider has a lot less control over the situation than a local authority does. Mm -hmm. You know, if a local authority is underperforming because of finances, well, they're the ones getting the money from the government. You know, the, the care providers aren't. So there has to be some really sort of robust thinking mm -hmm. about this. <sighs> Hat off. So boxed <laughs> off. I think there's been a, a, such a, an imbalance um, of, of power, in a sense, around regulation, hasn't there, when um, inspectors may have gone to um, local authorities to get their view on, on say, residential care home providers. Uh, but obviously, there's never been any opportunity for that to work the other way around. So there's something in, oh, well, you know, what, what might our partners say about us? Uh, which hasn't happened, has it, in the past? So there might there might be something to be gained all around. I think from you know everybody potentially at some point being in the same shoes, um, and so there's a real kind of drive to work collaboratively. Whereas mm -hmm. in the past, perhaps it was a bit less of a driver. I think you know that there was. I mean, certainly there was that push towards competition, wasn't there, to begin with. Uh, which um, you know didn't really didn't really help anybody. So I'm hoping that it might help what work towards collaboration and and just being aware of, you know, nobody's invulnerable. That everybody's going to be potentially on the receiving end of uh, a review from from another provider. We've had another question um, in the comments. Don't know why I was thinking of the word. Um, can one registered manager manage two companies? So slightly off topic, I have given a, a generic kind of response, but I wanted to bring it in. So I've said, yes, but the CQC will want assurance of how you're going to split your time, how you can ensure you can, you know, effectively manage both services. I was obviously worried about um, character limit that we have on, on the replies. Um, 
Tracy Karen, any insight for a registered manager that is going to register over, you know, multiple sites? Tracy, I'll come to you first, because I feel like it's probably more common in learning disabilities than it might be in, in elderly services. I would imagine as long as you can um, quantify your answer, obviously, in, in the application forms that you're filling in, but I would imagine the most, um, the, you know, the, the more kind of in-depth conversations will happen in your initial interview, they will want to know, you know, it, 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 obviously part of it for your person policy or all that side of things, but I think you know, if, if you are going to become manager over a couple of, you know, uh, two or three different, you know, actual uh, physical places, um, they're going to want to, uh, they're going to ask and want to, you know, how are you going to do that? And you're going to be able to have to kind of verify that, not from just what you're currently doing, but from, you know, your past history of demonstrating, um, you know, that you've got that experience and knowledge um trying, trying to best to answer that question like i say i think you can go so far in answering the questions from the the questions that they put in the application forms but i think it's going to be more about um in the initial interview where they're going to deep dive and, and ask you especially on the kind of your, your leadership and management experience that side of things um I, I get that an awful lot you know people say well i haven't got an actual physical qualification in leadership management but I always say as long as you can actually, you know, explain from your experience uh, prior, you know, what, what you've been able to do, uh, you know, can prove it. Um, I don't think you always have to have some form of actual qualification to back that up. Um, that's my experience uh, that I, I've come across so far. I think it, it also, um, Mark, probably depends on um, obviously the reason why you want to do it as I've, I've worked with um, a, a number of different care services and, and one example might be that they you know one of the directors decides that they're going to be registered manager of the first branch but they have an idea that they might want to grow that and so when they open a second branch they're then the registered manager for that second branch until they can nurture and grow and develop a, a manager mm -hmm. um, that they bring in uh, and then get them to the point where they feel all right. You know, we're confident now. We'll we'll put you forward for registered manager. And in that in that interim time, you know, a director's been the registered manager mm. across two different branches for, say, for example, domiciliary care, um, which is perfectly a fair sort of thing you know, and a manageable thing to do. Um, so I think it's um, it's something that happens. I think probably fairly often. You know, that that it, it's certainly possible. Yeah. I just want to come in on this as well. I think great advice from from both of you. Obviously, you, you're the experts on this, and I just want to come from a, a lived experience point of view. I'm I, I I was a registered manager for two services at the same time, um, and the, there are just certain just certain things I would like to say. Statement of purpose. Make sure in your statement of purpose you back up absolutely everything. Acknowledge that you're a registered manager of another site and how your time is split and supported. Succession planning is another triggered word to use all the time when you're talking to CQC. I appreciate that my time is split across two services. This is how I envision the percentage and proportion of my time. This is my reasoning behind it. So it might be 70% at one site, 30% at another. One might be 50 beds, one might be 20 beds. There's your reasoning. However, on that time when I'm not spending 70% of my time at this place, my succession planning plan is that my deputies, my team leaders, et cetera, et cetera, are trained and, and they're able to do this. Because not only does that allow the service to run whilst I'm not there managing that one because I'm on the other side, it also makes sure the service runs when I'm not there because I'm on holiday because I'm going to need it. So make sure that you focus on that succession planning angle as much as you can do. And, and just back everything up in your interview. Just explain why you're doing it, why there's a reason you're, you're the, the registered manager for two services. Don't go, oh, because I want to and I'm really, really work hungry. Showcase why your experiences validate you doing that and how the structure that you've currently got underneath you supports you to do that. Ideally, they would probably just want one person to be registered at one place. You really do need to back up why it is that that's the most viable option. So, Karen, like you're saying, it could be that you're actually bringing in a new trainee and you don't want to just throw them into the wolves and you're going to RM at both places and guide and support and maintain it that way. It might be that you are actually really just struggling to 
hire another registered manager. It happens. It, it is difficult. It's really, really tough. So in that case, I'd be saying I'm a registered manager at both sites, but because I'm joint registering at both sites, I've got two deputies in both car homes. So I've actually increased the under structure because whoever owns, because you're a registered manager and you're a registered manager on both sides, let's not be daft. You don't own that business. Very, very rarely will you own a business and be registered managers at two sites. You'd have to be absolutely daft to be able to do that. So someone is saving some coin somewhere because they're not having two registered managers and you need to acknowledge that within the service as well so cqc will know that they will know because they've got one registered manager looking over two sites they'll go so where's the rest of that money going where you could have spent it on a second registered manager showcase that it's being used and invested into support systems below you so it's completely doable it's a headache and you need the support of your director and operator but as long as you're confident in your abilities and you're competent in what you do it is a thing you can do, but they will want to grill you more so than just a normal registered manager. Mm. And they will not try and trip you up, but they'll go, but so this is a, a home care, like I was. I was a home care service and a care home. So it was like, well, how does your expertise from the care home transfer to the home care? Do you sure you've got both sets of knowledge that you actually need? So it's it's really, really interesting. Um, and I will say, if that's what you want to do, do it. But yes, very, very sort of... They will focus on that ability to split your time and support your team and the people who are providing the care to. <sighs> I'm going to put a plug in it and go back to Mark. <laughs> Can I just add an extra bit as well? I think it's really massively important that you have a really good solid business continuity plan as well. No, 100%, 100%. So we know some of the changes that are happening but we also know that CQC are planning some other changes. So I'm going to share a link into the um, comments in a section um, in a minute. Um, so they are currently looking at how they can make it more transparent, how their inspections and the reports are portrayed on their own website for families, for, you know, for providers themselves. Um, and they're currently collecting research on those proposed changes. So it's on something called Citizen Lab, which I know a number of people um, that are watching tonight. Are but if you're not, it's something that I think you should probably register. It's free to register. It's part of the CQC. But you can basically a survey and you can share your opinions on what some of those changes look like going forward. So at the moment, they're proposing it for GP surgeries. Um, now Adam's got an image that we can share of potentially what one of those um, is going to look like. So this is potentially how it would look. So the number in the middle is how you've scored out of 100. Um, there's also going to be some regional graphics that come up so you can see kind of how you compare to other services um, within your area, but also nationally. So you can see kind of visually very clear actually where you are compared to a, to a national scale. Karen and Tracy, what are your what are your thoughts? Let's touch on this this rating system first. What what are your thoughts on this? With the rating system, it's um, I've had a look at how they're they're planning on uh, rating the, and it's it's a uh, it's a more detailed process really. The the proposed coming to a rating for each of those key questions because they're going to rate the. Um, you know the quality statement uh, in relation to each of those areas they're going to look at the evidence categories which we've not touched on yet have we but they're going to look at the evidence category so the rating is going to be at a quite a grassroots kind of level and then all are added up and, con and, and aggregated so that they they come to um a, a rating for each of the key questions that you can you can unpick really which is something that you haven't been able to do in the past um the the inspector would would look at the key lines of inquiry and come to an overall judgment based on um just their in their expertise and their skill and their experience of of inspection but there would be no route map there would be nothing that you could check on that um and there isn't at the moment you know to be able to go back and say well actually how did you really come to that conclusion mm -hmm. and make that rating decision um so i think that's uh, an attempt to make that more transparent you know that you can see ratings being built up uh, for each of the areas and then that will obviously then translate into um 
an overall rating for the service. So I think as far as that's concerned, it makes it a lot clearer. The reports, I think their intention is that the way that they will report under the new way of inspecting uh, will be simpler and more straightforward. And perhaps, although I'm not certain, but perhaps a little bit more public facing rather than provider um, facing. So uh, really, I think in the intention behind the, the reports that are published now, although obviously anybody can look at them and they're published, so you know people have access to them, they have a feel of being more of a private conversation between the inspector and the provider because they go into such a lot of detail. There's often you know a fair amount of uh, jargon and you know um, uh, vocabulary in there that's not necessarily that user friendly. So I think the idea is that CQC is going to make that more transparent. In simplifying it and in making it more transparent, there is always the risk of losing some of that detail and losing some of the um, the, the reasoning behind it in the, in the very fact that you're going to strip it back. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, CQC um, work with that in order to create consistency, because that's the big thing, isn't it? You know, it's something that's come up in the past about individual inspectors interpreting things in their own way. Um, I would hope that they would have something about consistency in the way that they're training their inspectors to, to use this new system. And that's what I was going to say is that I think it's great for benchmarking and I think it will definitely highlight very clearly whether there is a locality divide. Um, I think one thing that I'd be interested in knowing is actually if you've got outstanding rated care services or even requires improvements, actually whether there's going to be a benchmark that's aggregated for that. Um, so actually we can visually see whether or not, you know, whether it is just one inspector going around giving lots of requires improvements or lots of outstandings or whether actually that is, you know, what they've been trained to do and we obviously know from the cqc from the statements that actually they're still in the process of training their inspectors in the new, new methods so there is another slide as well which i i quite like which is the one that compares it to other regions so let me bring that down. adam and i are both doing it at the same time um so there's this one here tracy what are your your thoughts on on this so this is obviously a doctor's surgery that they've used as an example but it gives you kind of where they're sat um in their journey, so 72 in the in the good, um, and then obviously the comparison to what other GP surgeries are in, in England on, on this one. Well, first of all, it's a good visual. Um, I think that's first of all, uh, making it transparent so that, you know, people can see it's got an actual visual using graphs, that side of thing is always good. Um, yeah, comparing it as a, you know, having, like you say, it's, I suppose it's like having your Ofsted, isn't it really, with, you know, you've got your, your 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 standards, and it shows you know with a school where you are within compared with everybody else. So I I, I think it's a good way of doing it. Um, again, I would say anything that just gives a little bit more information um, and is a lot more easily to see visually is definitely going to only help. Um, whether they. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking of kind of like your Ofsted inspections and how they, you know, give you a full rule down, rundown of all the schools. And it's it's not name and shaming, but they, it is quite competitive um, in how they do that, whether that it is going to, the CQC will ever do that as a kind of like providing a, a rundown table of who's at the top and who's at the bottom. I don't know. Would that be good? I don't know. And we've got one more slide, which is taken from the survey. Um, so let's add that. So this kind of gives you a, a bit of a better picture of kind of, so it's giving you a reason why they look at those changes, um, a bit more insight into those graphs. So I was just having a look on the link that I've shared in the comments. They've only had 37 people um, that participated in this, um, this survey. So I definitely think that if you're watching and you think actually I really like this, or if you think actually I really don't like this, that you should, you know, hop on and, and give your feedback. I will be honest, it is quite a lengthy survey. It's not, you know, a five minute and you're done job. You probably want to leave like 15, 20 minutes to do it. I think for me is they're capturing a lot of data from care providers now and they're asking a lot of care providers to go digital. And actually, I think for me, these visual graphs actually show that they're utilizing some of that data um, as opposed to, you know, lengthy reports that we know were 
who they had sentences that they could pick and choose from to make those reports. So I personally um, like them. We've had a question come in um, for Karen. Um, Karen, what impact do you think the new report style will have on FAC and legal challenges? We know reports are a bullet point style now. Don't know if that's something you can answer or not, but I thought I'd bring it in. I think it's interesting. I think it might be difficult because I think it depends uh, what kind of detail are, are, are in the new reports. And it, it, we've only got um, the guidance to have a look at. But um, my understanding is that there might not be the wealth of detail that you're used to seeing in order to um, evidence why um, why why service has perhaps got a requires improvement or an inadequate rating or a breach of regulation. Um, in a particular area, uh, because that would be quite a detailed deep dive, wouldn't it, in a report? Mm. And if they're not going to be particularly detailed, then where will that information actually be for providers? And if it's not in the report, then the, the factual accuracy sort of challenge would have to be, well, you know, where where have you got the evidence for that? And can you please demonstrate that to us? Um, so it could provide an extra layer of um of request, I suppose, in order to find out how the inspectors come to that that conclusion and that uh, that judgment, which might make things a little bit more opaque. There's a potential for that, but you know, obviously, I don't I, I don't know how it would work in in practice until we see. They may have taken all of that into consideration and thought about how they're going to express. Um, how they're going to write down when services are you know in enforcement action and that kind of thing where they really need to write a great deal of of, of detail um uh, in, into the report in order to make it clear why, why these things have happened but i mean i suppose even now if if you're talking about something as um as detailed as enforcement action there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes isn't there with warning notices and all the written stuff that the provider gets sent to them that the report will only re will actually encapsulate that in a much more in a briefer sort of way so there may be there may be ways in which um uh, people who are working on behalf of uh providers who want to challenge or who want to um submit factual, factual accuracy um, comments themselves that they might be able to look at the data that's behind that i'm not sure so <sighs> I'm looking at the time and I want to talk about this all night long because I think <laughs> quality assurance of care services is is absolutely massive and something we all need to be focusing on. My concerns on this, and I just want to know if these are gonna if you if you can alleviate them with what you've heard, is we have regulation to tell us whether we're doing things right or wrong to make sure that the services we're providing are are good and that the, the people receiving those services are having safe, effective, caring, responsive and well led care, basically. If, and this is a, a thing brought up from Michelle in the comments, but if the reports um, are going to be brief um, and, and, and not that detailed, is how are we supporting providers to get better? How does this new framework, which makes things better for the inspector, which makes things apparently better for, for people to see in their services, um, however, Zeta in the comments has said that actually the relatives who've been shown this survey, which I think is fantastic, by the way, if you're running a service um, and you know of this survey and you know of this consultation, get the people who are using your services involved and their relatives. But they're basically saying, actually, without understanding what 72 points means, it means nothing to us what a 72 is. You know, we've got to be able to see how it does. So if all of this is going on to try and change the framework, how do we then support people to get better properly? Instead of just going, oh, it requires improvement, how do we use these new reports? How do we use this new framework to actually improve and get better rather than just put people into embargo situations where they can't mm -hmm. take people in, they financially crumble, and then they close? How do we promote getting better to people? CQC, are they going to start recommending things? Because usually they'll come in and go, this policy is rubbish and that's rubbish, but we can't tell you what to use. So is that going to change in this new framework? Is there going to be anything that's going to support people to improve? Either of you. Well, I don't know the answer to that. However, um, what was coming to me while you were speaking about that was is to look back to their strategy. And a big driver in their strategy is this idea about driving improvement. 
I mean, that, that is one of their big aims, isn't it, in, in terms of moving into this new phase of regulation. So it's clearly something that they want to do. They want to influence the outcomes for people for the better. That's their stated aim. Um, so I can't, I, the discussions must include that somewhere. But, it, you know, how they actually do it, it would take quite a sea change, I think, because um, CQC are regulators, aren't they? You know, they, they're not historically they haven't been there to provide guidance or to provide advice or to say why don't you use this template or you're not doing it right here let me show you how they've never really had that that's never been their role it's one of the reasons i decided to come out of cqc and be a consultant was that i wasn't really permitted to do that because the role didn't encompass that you know within the job description um so individual inspectors you know can't help that that's just the way it is but in order to drive improvement i think you know that's got to change hasn't it i'm not at, at the moment i'm not quite sure how that's going to knit together i don't know if anybody else has any ideas on that i'll be honest i'm really really hoping with you know instead of it just being literally you know um you submit you have your initial interview and then you wait for an inspection i'm really hoping with this more kind of um uh, interaction with the, the the team that you're going to be allocated is going to be on a more regular basis so that if you are if you have your inspection and you're you are you know inadequate i'm hoping especially with the reporting online that they, the, this team of cqc people that you're going to be working with will get you into the you know into the good rating a lot quicker so you can change your rating on on screen a lot quicker and that if you are instead of just being allocated with one inspector you're going to be part you know you're going to have access to this team it will be a lot more of an interactive conversation backwards and forwards i'm hoping and i'm, I'm understanding that's what the cqc are looking for and i'm hoping that's what it's going to be i think that's Thanks. a really good point sorry um Tracy, because that there is going to be a team isn't there you know yeah. there are, there's going to be inspectors there's going to be these regulatory coordinators there's, there's going yeah. to be some triaging kind of support uh, and some admin that's going to be underpinning their support for planning and that sort of thing mm -hmm. so that's a whole lot better than uh, what we've had so far i think in terms yeah. of the inspector having the whole of that responsibility um, all themselves yeah i promise i'm not going to be um cynical <laughs> and go um well i know what they're telling us we're going to have um, but the government promised us 500 million in funding and like <laughs> 50. And actually, we've been promised liberty protection mm -hmm. safeguards for the last what feels like a decade. And that's not <laughs> yeah. fruition. And yeah. we all know that the CQC are going through some terrible, terrible staffing crises at the moment. So I would hate for us to take that as gospel. And that's what's going to happen. But yes, the idea of these mm. teams is fantastic. Yeah. I'd love to see their sort of action plan of how they're going to recruit and achieve that. Um, because I think that is something that they need to improve on moving forwards is that candor and that sort of transparency with services mm. to go, actually, we're not going to hit target. The new framework won't be out this year. It's going to be out next year. These are the reasons why, and this is what we're doing to improve. Very simple, one page, there you go, you're up to date. Um, mm. With that and the candidness, I just want to come on this before I hand back over to Mark is, okay, if they're not going to get into this position where they're going to go, this is what we recommend you do to change, this is the support that we're going to give you, blah, 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 then one thing providers should not do and should not stop doing, actually, at this moment in time is doing your own sort of impact action plans post-report. As soon as you get that report, even if you've got five goods across the board, you break it down, you show the people that you're supporting, the relatives and your team, this is the report, this is what they've said, this is how we're going to improve, this is how we're going to maintain. If you get a requires improvement or an inadequate, the first thing you do is you, I mean, if you want to challenge it, challenge it, and if you don't need to take legal action, do that. Break it down, be honest, be open. This is what they found, this is how we're going to improve it, this is what we've learned. Because otherwise, people are going to lose trust in you. If you can admit it and go, actually, yeah, we have had an F report and this is what it is, this is how we're going to change things. It just adds that confidence. And then find your Facebook groups, find your managers groups, find your peer support groups. Come to the caring view. We're not making money from this from you. You, you are getting all of this free. 
come and find the resources, come and message us and go, actually, Adam, Mark, in my last report, they told me that my audits weren't up to scratch because I didn't have one that looked at this. Do you have anything that you can give me? Do you have anything that you can send? Mm. CQC cannot recommend stuff, but we as providers, we as social, social care is more than just a workforce. It's an idea, it's a passion, it's a community. We can support each other. So if you're struggling, ask someone. If you get a NAF report and they're saying that you're not doing this or you're not doing that, even if it's during your inspection, you've got a two-day inspection and they've gone, you need this, and you haven't got it, overnight, find it, take it in the next day. Actually, I found this, and I'm going to implement it, and this is what I've got, and I'm, I'm using it now. So just whatever you can do, just show you are learning and growing, and we are all here to support each other. That is all I would say on that, Mark. No, I think that's all great advice. My only bit of advice would be, to, as well, is if you're sending documents to them, because obviously it's electronic inspections, is make sure you password protect each individual document so that you can be certain that they've got the password from you to open those documents. Because I have seen on a number of the manager forums that people have been given requires improvement, but the CQC have never asked for the password, so they've never been able to open those documents. So actually, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you do password them. It doesn't need to necessarily be the same password. Um, Adam, your kind of advice spurred me on. I was very conscious of time. I wanted to just do a round robbing of just a final tip, nothing too in depth, of how to be prepared and how to stay up to date with the changes that are happening. Just one one top tip. Um, and before you do it, please do feel free, Tracy, Karen, to plug your services. We'll share your website as, as you speak as well. So yeah, there's no, um, I think for me, I, everything that Adam touched on, yeah, please do reach out for us if if you need advice. You know, we're, we're sharing a document or a resource um, every Friday, Freebie Fridays. Um, we're always looking for, you know, what managers are struggling with here and now and trying to put that out and obviously there's so so many that you know posts that we see of people saying oh, actually we really need this or we really need that you know reach out to us on linkedin or facebook or twitter and we'll try and ping something over to you on an email if we've if we've got it so tracy i'll come to you first any tips on how to be prepared and how to stay up to date with any changes all of the obvious ones is you know um do have a look at the, the the newsletters you know the updates that come from the cqc make sure that you you signed up for their their updates um we all get bombarded with emails don't just delete it do actually have a have a look and see if there is anything um and and and, and look for webinars like this you, you know come along to as many get yourself as clued up uh, uh, as much as you possibly can and like what you guys have just said reach out to other people your peers other people have you know, have the discussions, um, you know, work with other, you know, collaborate with other people within your industry um, and just keep yourself up to date. That's all I can suggest, really. Thank you very much. And Karen? Uh, I think one of the things that we haven't touched on perhaps um, maybe enough doing this is just to just to plug that really quickly is um, when, when you're preparing for the new inspections the, and the new way of being able to gather your evidence, do keep looking at those six evidence categories that, mm -hmm. that they, um, are going to be looking at, that are going to be gathered, because out of the six, three of them are feedback. So if you get yourselves, um, if you're proactive and you get lots of feedback from the people who use your service, um, relatives, healthcare professionals, um you know uh staff and, and and leaders within the service then if you've got feedback that you've gathered and you know from lots of different sources it's less likely that they will then feel as if there are lots of gaps that they've got to plug so look at those evidence categories um and then the other thing i suppose is just about about myself um i support registered um providers and registered managers with a, a lot of different things it might be mock inspections it might be helping with the pir it might be just spending a day on in service just to chat about things or to just pick the phone up and say can i just you know can, can we just have a couple of hours just to talk through some things so there's a whole broad range of things and if anybody's out there that just thinks i just want to get in touch find out what you can do to help us just you know just get in touch and we can have a chat thank you very much and talking about the pir there is a pir podcast on our um or podcast series on our podcast so i will share the link to that so everybody's got that that karen joined us on that broke down the pir into 
bite-sized pieces so you can literally fill it in as you're listening to Karen giving her advice. So, Adam, over to you. Any final tips or bits of advice? Uh, Tina's just reminded us in the chat that CQC do have their own YouTube channel. Um, they're probably all on strike at the moment, so probably nothing going up. No, I'm joking. Um, so do go and check out their CQC channel. I just, I think we do really need to work with um, CQC as much as we can do. I know I pull the, you know, the, the legs as much as I can on this, but <laughs> it is important that we support and work with our regulators. I'll, all I would say, and I won't actually touch upon the regulation side of things. I'm going to touch upon personal development because well led is a category. Do your CPD. I know it's boring. I know it takes time. Do your CPD. You need to do your CPD. Do your CPD. If you're going to do anything, do your CPD. Show CQC what you've learned. And don't just go, I went to this webinar and I learned this and I got, or I, they spoke about this and I got three CPD points. I went to this webinar. They spoke about this. My main takeaway points were this. I implemented them into my service like this. This was the impact on the people I support showcase how your learning has grown your service and your business and split if it makes it easier split your cpd up into different categories so mm -hmm. split it up into safe caring well-led respect uh, um, uh, responsive and effective you know split it up into those different things so actually when cqc come around and they go well how do i know that you're being safe well actually a couple of the webinars i've been on flip three cpd mm -hmm. folder this on safeguarding this on LPS, this on this, this on that, has shown that this is my learning and this is how I've implemented it. This is the impact. So as long as you're doing things like that, they will understand and they will, and you've got it then for, you're not a manager now. People listen to this who aren't a manager now, do it, start now. You're a care assistant. It's amazing, start now. So when you go and do your registered manager interview, flick through your CPD folder when you're on the phone to them. You know, tell them where you've been and how you're investing in your learning. Do your CPD. Santa Claus will bring you a nice big <laughs> present at Christmas if you celebrate it. Uh, or, you know, whatever presents you get during whatever holidays you celebrate. You will get something fantastic. It's important. Do your CPD. There we go. <laughs> did I get that point across, Mark? You did. And I did share in the comments, my only other bit of advice that popped into my head was don't gatekeep information. There's a lot of changes happening. And Adam and I have spoken about this before. Is, you know, if you've had a recent inspection, share your experience, talk about what they asked, how it went for you, any insights. If you've seen an event advertised, you know, share it and, and collaborate and we can all learn together and actually, you know, because ultimately it's only going to benefit social care altogether and it's going to elevate, you know, the positive image of the sector. Um, Yes. 100%. Don't be that person in a Facebook group who goes, oh, I've had a really bad day today. I've had my inspection and it's not gone well. And then someone goes, why? What have they looked at? Do not reply with, DM me. Send me a message. I'll tell you. Just tell everyone. It supports everyone. It benefits everyone. We're not going to mock you. We're not going to laugh at you. We're going, oh, oh my gosh, I had that as well. Here's what I did. Here's my knowledge. Here, take it. It's free. Yeah. Oh, I would, honestly, we could talk about this all night long. Tracy, <laughs> Karen, it has been an absolute delight, an absolute pleasure. Thank um, you. you yeah, Thank you're most welcome. And we told you we'd keep it positive. It is all positive. It's all about growth and and fantasticness in social care. Mark, next week we're not here. We get well. We don't get a week off. We're going to be in the background, but we've got a takeover show next week, and I'm going to announce it because I'm really, really happy. My other half, Stephen, and his colleague uh, Chris are going to be coming on, talking all about tips to maintain your well-being. And I don't mean little things. I mean my other half is a holistic therapist, so there's going to be guidance on meditation, on breathing techniques, on everything that actually really does benefit you. You know, it's going to be wonderful. They're going to do a full hour's takeover. Please do come with your questions. Um, come If you've got problems, if you're struggling to do things, if you do meditate or you're struggling to meditate, come and ask those questions. It's going to be really, really fab. And they're going to give you tips and guidance on how you can take that into your teams and how you can support your team's mental health and well-being as well. It's going to be a whole different take on it. Um, something a little holistic, something a little different, something a little fun. And then obviously the week after that, I think we're a no show because we are live at Health Plus Care as well. So on our YouTube channel, we will see you back here in three weeks' time. But do come back next week because it is a takeover all around mental health and well-being. www.thecaringview.co.uk. Everything will be on there anyway. So until then, do take care. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you for all of your questions and your comments. Um, and we will see you on our next show or live at Health Plus Care. 
Take care. Bye. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>